let's get started with some of the basic expectations for your paper. So since this is a junior level course in a liberal arts discipline, it's going to be anticipated that you are writing at the collegiate level and proofreading for grammar, spelling, and syntax. It's also expected that you will be able to provide consistent, plentiful, and proper citations, ideally using the Chicago Humanities or Turabian footnote style. Or, if you're, not a, if you're not a history major, I will accept MLA parenthetical. But please note, in both of the citations, they must include the page number of the article where the information is coming from. It's important in your papers that you avoid plagiarism. And it's also important that you use your paper as a means of demonstrating the level of understanding that you've developed about this idea. Under no circumstances are you to use any excessive quotes. On too many students' papers over the past few years, I have seen more from the articles than from the student's own mind. If you use excessive quotes, I will not grade your paper. In fact, it is my challenge to you to not use any quotes. You should be able to paraphrase what you have read. I will, I'll go back on that. I'll allow you one quote from an article. But I do not want to read an arrangement of long quotes from different authors and very little input from you. So please do not rely on excessive quotations. I'll give you one quote, but it should not be over two sentences. And you should be working to be able to paraphrase uh, the ideas of your secondary sources. Additionally, when you paraphrase, you need to cite. And if you're having difficulties with the concept of citations, please note that I've provided a couple of really good links to help you um, review these ideas on the general channel of our MS Teams. In terms of formatting, this is a four to five page paper and I know all the tricks that are out there. The big one being people who go excessive on their font sizes, 12 point max. Most people anymore are using 11 point, but if I don't, I don't want to see anything very large nor do I want to see the first page consist of about half of the page size devoted to your name, the class name, and then my name, and then summer 2020, then a paper title, and then three sentences and you call it one page. That's not going to work. Really, you should be able to get all of your information about the paper and your name and the paper title taken care of in either the first page header or no more than an inch at the very top of your paper. Do not double space between your name, the date, the class, and whatever else you're including in that header. If you just want to skip all that together and include a cover sheet, you may include a cover sheet, but it will not count towards page length. As I said before, four to five pages, double space document, and don't be clever in the margins. They should not be over an inch and a half. All right, um, stick to the presets. And again, I don't think very many people are guilty of this sort of things, but the ones who are, we can always find them because it really stands out when your paper consists of far fewer words than all of your peers. And so by four to five pages, we're talking solid pages, not four and one sentence. And if you go over the link, that's fine too, but don't go over more than I don't know if you did something crazy and did seven pages, that that would be getting excessive because that's not the nature of this assignment. And lastly, make sure you check out those writing resources that I've provided on the general channel for our MS teams. There's some good stuff there. And especially for those of you who aren't really confident with your grammar, simply because, you know, the further we move away from having been in a high school level English class, sometimes this gets a little sloppy and you forget, you know, what are the rules on commas. Um, there's some that there's one of the resources called uh, Grammar Girls uh, Dirty Dirty Tricks and Tips. That is a really cool resource. So check that out, and it'll help you in your other classes too. All right, for our assignment, this paper is going to be focused on 
understanding British social class in the 19th century. Okay? And your paper is going to be very specifically focused on the assigned readings from week three. That said, do not add other sources that were not assigned. And do not try to Google your way to a paper. I've included some very specific sources which should provide you with plenty of information to write this paper. And I'm not going to be impressed if you're adding books and things that I've not assigned. That's going to make me suspicious because I think that I've really given you a lot of material that you can use and I want to see it used. Now, again as a reminder, I want to see proper citations that include a specific page number for the information, not the page numbers encompassing the entire article. If you are reading an article and you found something on page 38 of that article, and the go with the article pages as they are printed on the PDF, not the PDF numbers, okay? So there'll be numbers like 37, 47, things like that. And that's the citations we're going to need because we want to be able to go back and see what you were using. The paper is focused on the experience of class in Britain, okay? That said, you're not writing about Europe in general. No mention of Europeans. The British do not consider themselves Europeans. And you're not writing about something very general either. We're being very specific on the experience of class in Britain. Now, that said, again, when we talk about Britain, you know, Great Britain is uh, the area of England and Wales and Scotland. We'll talk about the British people, the English people. You can talk about the United Kingdom if you want to throw in you know, Northern Ireland into the mix. But we're talking about a very specific area. So talk about the British or the English. But we're not going to talk about Europeans. So don't try to have a vague generalization. And we're also talking about a very specific time, the 19th century. It is imperative that you complete the readings and take your notes before you write the paper. The reason is, if you do that and you build up this body of knowledge that you have in advance before you sit down and start thinking about how to organize this paper, it'll be so much easier to do the writing assignment. In fact, if you really spend a lot of time from now until Sunday reading these articles at a nice slow pace, really getting into them, taking your notes, and appreciating you know, the material that's there, it'll be very easy to write your paper because you'll have all the information that you need. It will take you a lot longer and it'll be a lot more frustrating if you're trying to do the same two assignments at the same time. So please do your readings first, take your notes first, then write your paper. And above all things, do not start this assignment on Tuesday morning because this is not something that you want to do at the last minute. And it's, this is something that you is going to really help you for your final assignment as well. But it, it's not a good idea to do things at the last minute. Your grades will be better. You'll be happier. Life will be less stressful if you give yourself plenty of time. Now, the prompt as we have it is, how did the British social structure change during the 19th century? Okay, that's the big prompt. Now, the purpose of this essay is to demonstrate that you've read and understood the assigned readings, and you can organize and use the information to develop an argument. Think about it this way. If we were in a face-to-face -face class, having conversations every day, it would be easier for me to kind of intuitively see whether or not you've understood something. Facial expressions, body language, all that. That's not the case in an online course. Your written work is what I have as evidence whether or not you've understood. So it's very important that you take these assignments and you be very intentional because vague responses and generalizations that it looks like you've not read anything or you're just kind of meandering your way towards what you think is the answer, that doesn't prove you've read or understood the assigned readings. And so if you think about your 
work as it's the evidence in your case. You're trying to plead a case that I have read this, I've understood it, I can use this. You, it, it'll be a better experience because at least you know what you should be doing. And vague and vague responses and generalizations in history are just bad habits. The essay must use at least for the signed readings. That means I want to see citations from everything that you use in your essay, but it has to include at least four of them, all right? Chances are the best essays are going to use many more. But I want you to be able to really integrate four of these assigned readings into your essay. The more the better, and the better usage of them, of course that's going to produce a better grade. But that means these should be the essays that you're going to draw from and this will have the information that's really going to demonstrate how well you understood this. Now, because this is a short essay, I've gone ahead and I'm, I'm going to help you organize it by giving you four central questions that your essay should answer. And in fact, if you think about each of these as paragraphs or sections, when it, you, know, you add the introduction, the conclusion, and then each of these, par these, each of these questions can be a paragraph, it's a pretty easy way to get your five pages awfully quick. So here are your questions. How did the traditional British class structure change during the 19th century? And if you think about it in these terms, one class is going to be becoming more narrow, another class is going to be becoming more complex and growing, and then there's the other class that's going to be further, in, you know, also expanding but changing in its identity. And so if you know which classes those are, that will help. But think about how it changed. So and our traditional structure is always, you know, goes back to the Ancien Regime where you have the upper class and the lower class. So let's think about how the expansion and the complexity and what's driving it. And if you know anything about what we've been talking with the Industrial Revolution, you'll figure out what's driving it. So second question what characteristics define middle-class life during the 19th century? Think in terms of who are these people? What are the gradations within the middle class? Um, especially where in the middle class is it becoming, you know, closer to an upper class? Where is it emerging out of what would have been one time, the working classes? Who, who's composing these elements within the middle class. What's it like for men or women? Um, what kinds of things are they doing that are specifically middle class? It's not always about their jobs, but there are other things connected to it. And the same goes for uh, what characteristics define the working class. And remember the working class is not the underclass so much. Now the underclass, these are your criminals, your your destitute people, um, prostitutes, orphans, that crowd. Now they're at the very bottom of the social structure. Your working class, these are these are wage, uh, these are these are you know, earning people. They earn a, they're not a salary, but they earn a wage, and you know there are also different levels within the working class. And most all of the working class, it's manual labor. And so, what characteristics are shaping their experience? Now, in some cases, if you look at crime and things like that, I mean, they're very close to that precarious state of at some point you could lose your standing in the working class and slip down the slope into the underclass. But what is it about being the working class? And where is, how is that changing as well? And then the last question is, how do the lives of the middle and working classes differ? And you can use the articles if it, where it talks about the experiences or, or the specific things, you know, and this is where, you, like I said, you can really use these articles cleverly. You know, what kind of examples do you have about their experience or when they interacted or is there something about the middle class that makes the middle class just distinctly middle class? I mean, that's where you have to fill in the gaps. And by asking you how did they differ, that means you have to have a point of comparison. All right. 
So those are your big questions. And like I said, you could add the introduction and a conclusion and then use these questions to kind of set up your essay around some paragraphs and you would be fine. And I hope you do that because if you leave off one of these questions, it is going to hurt your essay grade because I do want these answered. But don't don't write them as a question answer format. This has to be integrated into the essay. Does that make sense? I hope so. Now, the assigned readings. I've gone to the trouble of providing you with the proper citations for the assigned readings in MS Teams on the post that includes all of the different PDFs and also the post that includes the links to the British uh, Library website for those other two background readings. The readings, uh, and of course I also want to use this opportunity, when you refer to an author, you refer to them by their last name never their first name. You can list, you can identify them the first time with their first and last name, but references to authors need to be last name only. You do not know them. Even if you did, it's the last name. And so our first author there is Geoffrey Crossick. Geoffrey wrote to the classes and masses in Victorian England. G.M. Young, Mid-Victorianism. And that's a very good article for the middle class. Uh, and actually a nice general article. It's an old one, but it's a good one. Richard Sanders, How Football Was Born. That's some foreshadowing for our fun next week. David Flitness uh, wrote, wrote his work on Poverty's Policeman. It actually goes back to the very beginning of the 19th century. But a lot of the attitudes that are in that are easily transferred to the later 19th century. Then the two articles by Cole, Social Structure of England, the Working Classes, and the Social Structure of England, the Middle Classes. Um, and Cole is an economic historian, so that's why there's all those numbers and facts and figures in there. And then Morris uh, with the Industrial Revolution, Class and Common Interest. That's a very good article for you to integrate into your paper. And then uh, the two uh, collections with the uh, article and supporting primary sources uh, Lisa Picard's The Working Classes and the Poor from the British Library, and Catherine Hughes' The Middle Classes and Upward Mobility, also from the British Library website. So at least four of those must be used in your paper and with proper citations. Uh, I think that that's a, it's easy to kind of pull those together. And again, be clever. I mean, this is, this is your paper. Focus on you know, the areas of these articles that you've enjoyed, um, the interesting things, and uh, again, use this as a way to demonstrate your level of understanding. You want, an, you want an A for the course, you want an A for this paper, show me that you've, you've, you're understanding this, all right? Okay, so that's just your basic overview of how to write this paper. I think I've answered all the questions, I hope I've answered all the questions. I'll post this video and also have a printed version of the slides available to you as a PDF. And um, good luck, and I hope everybody, I, 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 don't, I know that people don't really enjoy writing the paper, but I, I hope it's a good experience for you. Because um, when you have time to prepare and you take it seriously, these assignments are, are less stressful and more meaningful.